Good morning, good afternoon and good evening everyone, wherever in the world you might be joining us from today. My name is Elena Stavrovska. I'm currently a research officer at the London School of Economics and Political Science and I will have the pleasure of moderating today's event. The event, as you know, is titled The Gendered and Gendering Aspects of the Pandemic. Um, it is the second in a series of webinars organized by the British Council as part of their Women in Science Resilience platform. Um, we will be organizing two more events uh, in February and March, uh, and I hope you will be able to join us then as well. Now, the current pandemic and the management thereof uh, through lockdowns and curfews has shown even more, not only the crisis of public health many countries around the world, including those in the Western Balkans are facing, but also, uh, and relatedly I would say, uh, the sharp existing inequalities. Um, around the world, the pandemic has, I mean, sort of cracked open, pulled back the curtain, if you will, on existing racialized, class, gendered, and intersectional inequalities. And these have been evident in every domain of life, from the care sector, where in many societies it was assumed the, the, that the ability of families, and this usually means women, to provide care in absence of childcare and el elderly care facilities was just endless or forever um, um, having the ability to stretch endless, endlessly, um, to the overrepresentation of women in the front lines of uh, in the health sector, to the economy where those working in the so-called inform informal economy or informal settings have been hit the hardest and not included in government's responses, often having often having to choose between ensuring a livelihood or remaining safe and healthy, to the assumption that everyone has a home and every home is a safe one in that initial response and adv advice we all received from our governments um, to stay at home. Now we have already seen the first studies on, of the, on focusing on the gendered and gendering impact of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, published with many not only showing the grim current situation, but also some suggesting this will set back significantly gender equality um, for decades to come. Uh, we have also seen some preliminary results from a rap rapid gender assessment done uh, by UN Women in the Balkans, but I've also seen some um, civil society organizations crossing my um, social media uh, timelines uh, of people people doing research on the on the on the pandemic. Now, uh, with all of this in mind, today's webinar starts with a curiosity about what the situation has been like in the Western Balkans, as, as I said, but also how it con connects to these global trends. From what I can see, and this is uh, based on anecdotal evidence, I think that many of the global trends we can actually see in the, in the Balkans as well. Um, today, I have the distinct honor of being joined by three speakers, incredible researchers and practitioners and um, civil society um, activists um, working in or on different countries in the region, including Albania, Montenegro and North Macedonia. Um, so allow me to introduce the speakers. Um, Maya Rajcevic is Executive Director of Women's Rights Center um, in Podgorica, Montenegro. Um, within the activities of the center, she works directly with women survivors, survivors of gender-based violence and discrimination, supporting their protection and access to justice. She runs workshops on gender equality, women's human rights and violence against women for NGOs, youth and respective institutions. She was the author of numerous reports and publications on women's human rights and uh, participated, has participated in the preparation of a series of national policies in the field of gender equality and gender-based violence. I'm introducing you in no particular order, or although I'll ask the questions in a certain order. Um, next, we have um, Dr. Anna Mishkovska Kajska, who is a researcher and activist affiliated with the Department of Political Science at the University of Amsterdam. She obtained um, there a PhD degree in social sciences and a Master of Science degree, cum laude, in sociology and gender studies. Her doctoral dissertation won the 2015 Gender and Politics uh, PhD Prize of the European Consortium for Political Research and, and was published under the title Feminist Activism at War, Belgrade and Zagreb Feminists in the 1990s. 
and I strongly recommend the book. Um, the book was nominated for the 2018 um, Joseph Rothschild Prize in Nationalism and Ethnic Studies. And in addition to feminism, nationalism and war violence, uh, Anna is interested in civil activism, LGBT issues, peace building and women's reproductive rights and freedoms. Last but definitely not least, we have Dr. Ermira Danai, uh, who holds a PhD in Human and Social Sciences from the University of, I'm going to mispronounce this, um, no, no Chattel? No, I'm mispronouncing that. Uh, Switzerland. And since 2002, um, Ermira has co authored and authored various research reports, books, articles, and other contributions related to gender and family studies with a particular focus in, on Albania and the Balkans. Her main research interests encompass the examination of gender in communist and post-communist Albania, the feminist activism in post-socialist countries, the gender analysis of migration, um, of violence against women, uh, of labor market, and so on. Currently, she is an invited lecturer on feminist studies and a visiting researcher um, at um, ISCT IUL in Lisbon. Now, welcome all three of you. Um, but before we get started, let me share a few uh, housekeeping rules, so to say. Today's event is planned to last approximately 90 minutes, with the first 60s or so being uh, dedicated to the speakers addressing the core questions around which the webinar has been organized. And then we'll have 30 minutes for Q&A to engage the audience. The audience members will remain muted throughout the webinar, but you have a chance to ask questions in the chat box or rather in the Q&A box, um, which I will then convey to the speakers. So feel, please feel free to write your questions as you think of them or at the end, whichever way you prefer directly in the Q&A. I will also kindly ask the speakers to mute their microphones when they're not speaking so we can prevent any interferences, especially as we many of us are calling from home today. Um, fine. Finally, please note, uh, this is a note to everyone, that today's webinar will be recorded. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Um, the first question that, um, that I would like to ask uh, for our speakers to reflect on is how women and men, and I apologize for the binary distinction here, uh, in the region have been affected differently by the pandemic and the management thereof. Here I, I am thinking of um, the different curfews we've seen, different lockdowns, uh, lockdown measures, and so on. Um, I, you all have expertise in different areas, um, so you're welcome to reflect either on your own expertise in a particular uh, area of this broad question or um, stick to the broad question as such. Um, let's start with Maya and then we'll go to Anna and then Admira, if that's okay. Let's keep the questions, if po uh, the answers if possible to like five to seven minutes so we have uh, sufficient time for Q&A in the end. Maya, the floor is all yours the virtual floor. OK, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and to meet you all online. Well, I have to say that um, my primary work actually is women who are affected by discrimination and domestic violence. And uh, that was one of the first actually uh, insights into uh, effects of pandemic. We realized that women who are suffering domestic violence are exposed to bigger danger due to the lockdown measures. And but not only that, it was also um, the reason for that was also that our um, uh, institutions uh, worked in limited hours and also um, they pr prosecuted only the most urgent cases. So women actually found themselves in the situation that, that even when they report violence, they are not getting proper response. So it was um, quite, um, quite concerning for us. At the same time, uh, the lockdown measures make, uh, enable them, uh, didn't enable them to, to go out from home and to uh, seek for help in cases when uh, during the lockdown hours. So it was uh, in many aspects very uh, uh, very hard situation and the situation we were not used to before. Um, so that was all, only one of the aspects of the pandemic. But at the other, uh, when it comes to other uh, fields, let's say, or women's and social life, there were also aspects related, uh, of course, for to their employment. So we now have the situation in Montenegro that since the beginning of pandemic, pandemic till today we have uh, around 7,000 uh, women, unemployed women more than we had before. So it really affected also women's ability to exercise their labor rights and uh, to be employed, which also affects, of course, 
their economic stability and uh, their independence, economic independence, which is also crucial for their uh, fighting uh, from domestic violence. So there are also many aspects, and one uh, that is particularly, uh, I would say, I would say hidden is actually the effect of pandemic of uh, women's unpaid work and their role into the, the private sphere. I would say that uh, even before the pandemic, we had a situation where women are mostly engaged into the domestic work and the unpaid work, uh, economy of care, etc. But in this situation, it's becoming uh, even a um, uh, bigger burden for women, particularly when we know that during the pandemic, our, the schools are closed uh, in Montenegro, for example, the kindergartens were closed for very long. And not to mention uh, the, the uh, situation with the gender segregation of professions where women are mostly, of course, um, in, included into, again, uh, uh, services, uh, health work, uh, on the first line with health as health workers and also in uh, we know that uh, the first one uh, that were hit by the pandemic were women in supermarkets who worked uh, for long hours without any protection at the very beginning and i would say that they didn't get any protection until finally civil society raised their voice and said that those women are mostly affected by the risk of uh, pandemics and that they should be protected in a way so it's uh, very complex and uh, but there is only uh, i would say one positive thing is in our countries it's very hard to get gender segregated data although it's also uh, something that is um, a legal obligation for our institutions but uh, this situation ex actually uh, brought to some very um, important and uh, useful researches in this area and now we have uh, some data uh, concrete data about how pandemic hit women more harder than men and i can tell more about it in the continuation of our today's talk i want to save space for my colleagues great thank you maya i think that kind of sets the the terrain quite widely for yeah. because there's so many different aspects in which where our lives are anyways gendered and, and unfortunately gendering uh, and there's so many different aspects in which the, the, the pandemic has hit and revealed something that we as researchers in this field and people who work in this field um, have been long aware for, of. And you're right that we do see a lot more gen gender segregated data now. Um, and not only, I mean, in, in terms of what's happening on the ground, but also in terms of everything being moved online. So for the white collar, um, aspect, so to say, we also have more gender uh, available data in terms of um, in in terms of gender as well, because now everything is online, so you can easily gather that data. I think. Um, okay, um, Anna, uh, would you like to share your perspective on this question? Yeah. Uh, hi. Hello, and thank you also uh, on my behalf. Uh, First, I want to say that I will. What I'm going to say uh, during this webinar has not been based on a specific research I have conducted, but more uh, generally uh, on uh, my interest in uh, in gender uh, inequalities, the gender dimension of, of different uh, societal uh, phenomena, uh, and also. Uh, very soon after the pandemic started, I became then also interested uh, in the gender aspect uh, of this crisis. And already in the introduction, uh, now uh, Elena uh, and now also Maya uh, said, uh, pointed to some to many things in the socioeconomic sphere. Uh, and now I want, uh, and I also uh, later, I'm going also to talk more about the socioeconomic sphere. But uh, at this stage, I would like to say something about the medical sciences and the gender bias in the medical science, which is something which uh, also, uh, uh, also we who are in social activism, social sciences sometimes uh, or often for, uh, forget um, to state. And uh, I was inspired uh, to uh, mention this because I, uh, uh, by reading uh, recently uh, an article uh, which was published in a medical uh, in a medical journal, and uh, this article uh, revealed uh, that uh, in the clinical trials which are undertake, uh, uh, undertaken around the world, uh, clinical trials for COVID nineteen, uh, 
maybe I'll just explain in one clinical clinical trial means uh, experimental procedure in which uh, new drugs or combinations or drugs are tested to establish the effects, whether they have an effect in treating a certain disease, whether they have side effects, etc. Uh, so um, this was a study uh, uh, of 30 uh, such clinical trials which have been taken around the world. Uh, and the team of researchers uh, from Belgium, Germany, Netherlands, who undertook this uh, study of these trials, they realized that there was astonishing lack of attention for gender in these uh, clinical trials. Uh, so, uh, and this issue has been so uh, important and striking that it was also recently raised within the European Parliament that there should be more attention for gender. Uh, so, more uh, concretely, what these researchers found out is that. Um, in, uh, nine, in 29 uh, out of these 30 trials, uh, the results were not controlled for gender. In other words, it was not seen, uh, it, uh, it was not checked whether the effects in women were different from the effects on men. Uh, uh, also, uh, there was no attention paid to the selection of uh, participants in the trial. Uh, so it was not ensured that there was an equal amount of women and equal amount of men participating uh, in these trials. Uh, so, and almost 25% of the studies included two times more men than women uh, in, uh, in the trials. So, um, Anybody with a basic knowledge of statistics uh, knows that if you uh, do a research on, for example, 100 men and 50 women, uh, and you don't take this difference in quantity into account, the results which you will obtain will be will say much less about women and much more about men because there were simply more men in the sample. Um, and because women and men have, and of course, also just like Ellen, I have to apologize. Now we speak in binaries, uh, predominantly uh, the disfemidar, um, to give the bigger uh, picture. Um, so since women and men have biologically different bodies, are born with biologically different bodies, and throughout the course of the year, their lives, their bodies are differently influenced by the environment, uh, one has to. Uh, uh, one uh, has to include as many women in the trials and uh, not including uh, as many women in the trials can mean can have as a consequence that the drug will be tested, it will be approved for use uh, and then it will be less effective on women or even damaging to women uh, because it was tested predominantly uh, on men or in a different way. A drug can be much more useful for women, but they will not have access to it. They will not be given this because uh, the studies, the clinical trials show that this drug wasn't effective. But again, it wasn't effective uh, on men. And uh, this is also something which we uh, need to keep uh, in mind uh, about the not only the drugs which are given in treatment, about the vaccines which are in the process of producing, that, uh, and also like regularly think about and point to the potential uh, and often existing gender bias. Yes, thank you, Anna. I think that's a very important aspect that we didn't necessarily consider. Well, I didn't necessarily consider in asking the questions, uh, but it is important and we see some now some of the discussions started around with vaccination starting here in the UK, in the US and well, slowly in the global north and then onward. Um, the, the questions are being asked whether the vaccine vaccines are uh, are safe for women who want to get pregnant or women who are pregnant, among other things, because that was not, not something that was even considered in the um, in the clinical trials. Um, so thank you for for highlighting this um, as well as we are hoping to see the end of the pandemic. Um, OK, um, Ermira. Uh, onward to you for your take on this first question. Uh, thank you, Elena, and uh, thank you all for inviting me. And uh, uh, I will uh, I will focus a little more in the case of Albania, and uh, I will base on some uh, recent studies uh, regarding uh, economic effects and uh, violence against women, and also a very recent study that was done by the uh, LGBT Alliance in Tirana, and it was very interesting. But in order just to emphasize uh, a little bit more what Maya said, and uh, just to give some uh, figures about Albania, uh, 
it, it was it was the same. I mean, it was the same pattern uh, as also in other countries that uh, uh, there was a, a rise of the cases of uh, the, of domestic violence. But uh, and I think that that is also the case in uh, in other countries. In Albania, there was this discrepancy between the number of reports and the police departments or at the other institutions compared to the number of calls at the national helpline. Uh, and it's it's a really I mean this discrepancy is like always there, but during the pandemic it was really really striking. And uh, according to the to the national helpline, uh, in March there were 30% more calls than last year, and in April 50% more calls uh, than uh, last year. So there is like a visible increase in the number of calls uh, 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 from women uh, victims of uh, victims of violence. So it really showed how um, how unprepared uh, like we are in order uh, to, to, to adapt to such crisis. The pandemic this time, it might be another crisis in, in a couple of years or I mean, fortunately not, but there will be. I mean, there can be other crises. So uh, that was one thing uh, related to, to the lockdown. Uh, I will talk a little bit uh, later about the, the unpaid care work, but um, uh, I mentioned the study from the LGBT Alliance and there was something really striking there uh, uh, in the same study. So the authors were saying that uh, among the LGBTIQ community, there is this, uh, this uh, hierarchization, if I could call it, of discrimination. So not all uh, the groups are equally dis discriminated and transgender are those who really suffer the most. Because uh, because of being more visible or uh, so, uh, and this discrimination was uh, uh, noticed not only by institutions. So transgender is the group with the least of uh, assistance from institutions, but also with a, a very like precarious economic situation, because um, most of them work as sex workers in order to survive and to have some incomes. It's like for most of them, it's impossible to find other jobs. So they work as sex workers. So during the pandemic, they could not have this work. So their economic, financial, housing situation was absolutely precarious. And it still continues, but like the, this time of pandemic affected this group the most. So I just wanted to, and I will come again to this survey of uh, LGBTI, Q alliance because there were some very uh, very interesting findings, things that we know. But when you you have also the figures coming from from studies, it's like more visible and uh, to to discuss about them. So I'm just leaving time to the other questions. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, and thank you, Admira. I think that's a very another very important aspect because you know a because you move us a little bit beyond the bi uh, the binary that we've been. Uh, using well that the world has unfortunately been using and you shed light on another thing that has by and large been invisible or invisibilized rather in the public discourse not just in our in, in the countries of the region but but in in the whole pandemic altogether um okay uh, the second question is related to the first one but uh, kind of slightly zoomed out <laughs> if you will um what gender inequalities do you think, in your opinion or your experience, has the current crisis or actually multiple crises, overlapping crises, um, revealed? So not just COVID as a crisis, but, you know, you can think of it also as a crisis of um, late capitalism or crisis of, of, of public health, uh, healthcare and so on. Um, now, let's start with Anna so that everyone gets a chance to, to not speak first <laughs> or speak first. Uh, yeah, um, so I would also like what uh, Maya also uh, underlined this difference uh, between paid and unpaid work. I see it also uh, uh, as, a, uh, as one of the consequences uh, of this pandemic uh, that also uh, that it, it put uh, the, the burden of unpaid work on women in increased. Uh, and ho but hopefully there will be also more and more awareness about uh, uh, this uh, this work, which is not only uh, underpaid but also under undervalued, uh, and uh, and it's 
and I'm all, uh, and all, also I want to make the point uh, that uh, women who perform care uh, duties at home, who take care of children of elderly, they also work. Very often uh, we hear around us that these women don't work. It's all, they work, but uh, they only they don't get any financial compensation uh, for their services. So I think that uh, we, we cannot uh, repeat that often enough because uh, all around we hear uh, uh, that uh, un unjust uh, uh, construction. Um, so what we uh, so what we uh, with. Uh, what we had with the, with the paid work, which uh, with women performed, some of it continued outside of the home. Women had to live outside the home. Uh, some uh, was it was partially or fully transferred uh, to uh, to the uh, home environment. Uh, women continued to, to work from home. Uh, I speak now about the paid uh, employment, and some of uh, some of it was discontinued temporarily or permanently. And what we also see that uh, some of the women who uh, remained uh, employed, their workload increased, but not necessarily the compensation they get for it. And we, we can think here about uh, medical professionals who have to uh, treat more patients while having also more sick colleagues, but also because of having uh, to deal with more complex clinical clinical picture, pictures, uh, medical conditions, and also having to perform a more uh, complex uh, protocols to uh, prevent the further con uh, spread of, of the virus. Um, is, there's also increase uh, in the work done by educators who all of a sudden have to, uh, in many cases, have to uh, learn how to use uh, new uh, technologies have to obtain also to find ways to obtain uh, equipment and, uh, and a good uh, internet access. Uh, and also provide uh, the explanations uh, to uh, students and pupils in general, like really learn a new way of working or in situation when there is a phys physical education, there are situations when there is a re reduction of, of the class, so there are less students, but then the teachers have to repeat, uh, repetitively uh, teach the same the same topic, uh, which also leads to an increase uh, of their uh, uh, of their labor. Uh, but it, it, at the same time, we have uh, women wh whose work was uh, discontinued, uh, like tourist agents, uh, and uh, also even more precariously, women who uh, perform uh, domestic services in other people's homes. And uh, uh, I think here of women who clean uh, houses, uh, uh, babysit, provide uh, elderly uh, and pro or provide el elderly care for others. And uh, in many cases, they could not go to work because of lockdowns, um, uh, because of uh, the fear uh, their employers were afraid that the, the, an outside person would bring the, the virus uh, uh, in their homes. Uh, also cases when employers lose or have their income decreased, so they cannot afford anymore having uh, an outside uh, help. Or also situation when uh, having a lockdown and having everybody at home means that the homes already are already become very crowded and there is not also in, enough space, physical space uh, to host, uh, host, to have the Person, even if it contributes to the cleaning, uh, to the domestic uh, uh, tasks. Uh, and these uh, women, the domestic workers, are especially also uh, in a precarious position because very often they are, in, in, all, more often than not, they are part of the informal economy. Uh, and uh, once they lose their jobs or they have, of, they, they, they have their work uh, reduced, they cannot, uh, uh, they do not have access uh, uh, to, uh, to other income, to social benefits. They don't have an access to health care in case they get sick. And they're also even less protected uh, than other people. I mean, in the Western Balkans and also uh, more generally, there is a decrease in workers' rights in general. So even those who are officially employed uh, have less and less benefits, and that is even worse in case of those who are unofficially uh, employed. Um, and um, so in general, so here is also obvious, I want to make the point that although we will speak about uh, women uh, and men in general, that we also have to take uh, to keep in mind that in addition uh, to, to people to 
have people who don't fit the categories, the binaries, the transgender persons. We also have distinction within the categories, which it is not all women are not in the same position. Some uh, women are a better off uh, economically. Some women have uh, children or elderly people to take care of. Some sometimes these children or the elderly are uh, sick or have disabilities, which is an additional uh, burden. So there are various types. Uh, 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 of uh, types, there are, uh, there are various burdens which women uh, have to deal with, uh, and uh, what the, what uh, is here important uh, to note uh, also is that uh, various research that even prior to the pandemic, uh, pandemic's domestic uh, responsibilities remain predominantly a women's uh, task. And I found the data uh, from the from IGET, that's the uh, European Institute for Gender Equality. Uh, that's an uh, EU uh, institute uh, doing research uh, policies regarding uh, gender uh, equality. And uh, they, uh, they state that even uh, before the pandemic, women in the EU spent 13 hours, that's almost two work, full working days, uh, uh, so 13 hours more than men every week on unpaid uh, care and housework. And we can only uh, imagine uh, uh, while we wait for more uh, current uh, data, uh, what means in the context of uh, having uh, everybody at home, which means uh, having to cook and clean more, uh, it was already mentioned closed kindergartens, the chances of having a sick family member to take care of, it's uh, also increases in times of uh, pandemic. School children might need additional assistance with their homeworks and classes, which is also again one of the things which uh, is more often performed uh, by women rather than uh, by men. So I'll stop at this point. Yes, I'm also mindful of time. I know Ermira will have to go uh, in 14 minutes and we will also have one more question to go. But uh, yes, thank you for pointing out to this further blurring of, I mean, we as uh, as feminists and people working in, um, in, in, in gender, well, on gender equality, um, have always emphasized this notion that the public and the private are not, are not distinct. And I think uh, the pandemic has even further emphasized how very interwoven, how how we cannot analyze one without the other, how by separating them we further um, marginalize um, the needs, the lived experiences, and even the agencies of those who who predominantly work uh, in the home. I think Ermira, you also wanted to make a similar connections to um, to domestic care workers as well, right? Or uh, not for this question. I don't know, but I know uh, that you wanted to make some points in that in relation. Yes, to Yes, uh, I mean it's uh, it's what uh, Anna said, and I'm not going to, uh, to repeat because it's the same situation. So the domestic care uh, sector it's almost informal, and uh, what we saw during this pandemic it was especially this. So that uh, uh, many states are, are allowing this kind of informality because people can have some income. So. They are not just a burden for the institution, they can survive by themselves and it's fine. And during this pandemic, we saw that, uh, I mean, uh, this is not uh, this is not normal. I mean, if I can call it normal at all to have all these sectors uh, in informality and some income per month does not, it's not enough. So, uh, um, I mean, uh, so I'm not going to, to repeat what Anna said. I just wanted to say something uh, from a survey that was done in Albania about how, like, uh, if uh, parents were uh, in front of this choice, who is going to, like, cut out the working time or who is going to work from home? And uh, from this survey, 51% uh, of employed women uh, worked from home and only 25% of employed men work from home and when it was uh, when it was um, uh, about those self employed uh, the majority of those who uh, reduced their working time in order to care about house and children etc it was uh, again women so i mean this was something that we knew but this pandemic like accentuated really, really how unequal it's the, 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 the division of labor. And so how women are still considered as the carers. 
So, uh, and uh, I, I thank uh, Anna for uh, emphasizing that even within women, we have a kind of hierarchies. So it, it, it's just like, it's important to, to mention it. And I'm just taking 30 seconds to mention something else that it was noticed in Albania. It was about uh, LGBTIQ community again. Uh, uh, we talk so much about students now that uh, the lockdown and the pandemic affected them so much, young people that are uh, living in precarious housing, etc. So uh, they had to go back to live with their, with their parents. For LGBTIQ people, that was even more difficult because for some of them, parents had no idea that they were gay or lesbian, etc. So can you imagine like the, the, the conflicts and the pressures? And for some others, they had no relationship anymore with parents because of their sexual uh, orientation. So uh, um, the survey that I mentioned uh, uh, shows how the, the, the how uh, it was a kind of increasing of conflict and on uh, psychological pressure to young uh, people of LGBTIQ uh, community because of the housing difficulties. Thank you. No, that's such an important uh, point. I mean, it relates to something that Maya was saying as well, the, this assumption that the home, well, th that everyone has a home to go to uh, and that the home is a safe place, whatever that means, whether physically, uh, emotionally, verbally, and, and so on, but that a home is a safe place. So thank you for highlighting that aspect um, as well. Uh, Maya? Yes, uh, I can also uh, tell something about the home being or not being the safe place. Well, our experience during the pandemics uh, actually showed the increase in number of reported cases. Actually, all women NGOs in Montenegro, which are not that numerous, uh, recorded a significant increase in the number of reported cases. It's, it's, uh, it's from 20 to 30 percent, actually, more reports than it was before. But, uh, and uh, I would say that actually uh, the, the burden that was uh, somehow put on, on common women through the pandemics um, was reflected also by the work of women in civil society organizations, particularly those like uh, the one I'm representing who work, uh, who are working uh, in the support services. So I would say that we actually have a much bigger work overload than we had before. And somehow um, we are trying actually to, to make um, everything going on as usual, but it's really uh, uh, very, very difficult. And uh, it put a lot of pressure also to women NGOs that uh, had to provide uh, even um, uh, more broad services than before, they need to be more accessible than before. Many of us actually had new um, uh, hotlines for, for women that they can report to. And uh, with the same, I would say exactly the same amount of funding that, that we usually have. So it's, it's, it's actually, it shows how the, the burdens on common women is reflected also on us. And then at the same time, a lot of our beneficiaries faced a huge risk of poverty and uh, actually the real poverty because many of them uh, remain were employed in the informal economy and women were the first uh, to be hired, uh, uh, fired during the time of pandemic. So uh, many of them actually who are even so, uh, the pandemic actually uh, made really, really visible and uh, even more adverse the, the inequalities between women and men. And particularly when it comes to poverty, we had uh, in Montenegro uh, and I'm sure in other countries because I'm also collaborating with many women NGOs in the region. Um, there are many self-supporting uh, uh, parents, uh, women self-supporting parents that are actually uh, living alone with their children and uh, their ability to obtain, obtain alimony uh, in our countries was already very difficult. And during the pandemic, it somehow it became more difficult even because uh, many of their partners, uh, ex-partners or fathers of their children remained out of, of, out of work or they had different um, exclusions for not uh, paying the alimony on time. The, the courts were working in much less capacity than before, so the uh, execution of uh, court measures was, was also very difficult. So it's actually uh, hitting women uh, on many different grounds. And, um, what is also interesting for us was to listen to 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 see how the uh, government measures are actually taking into consideration the unequal unequal position of women and men, particularly 
uh, women from vulnerable groups like Roma women that are totally um, excused from every, excluded from every um, support uh, actually because uh, most of the government support were actually economic measures for helping uh, economy survive and um, uh, they usually were the packages of incentives for uh, entrepreneurs etc. And we know that uh, most of Roma women but also uh, I can mention L LGBT women, um, women with disability are not working and they, these measures never uh, ever take into consideration their, their position actually. But uh, again, uh, in general, government's measures were gender blind. And again, I have to repeat that there is uh, a legal obligation of, for all of, of our countries to um, do gender analysis and to do gender mainstreaming of each uh, measures and policies. But it, it was actually, it, it didn't happen. And uh, not only the uh, already brought measures were gender blind, that didn't take into consideration different positions of women and men, but some of them were really discriminatory. And I have the example to share. Just, uh, um, we have a new government now, but uh, the previous government um, uh, left their positions uh, like 10 days ago. And before they left their position, they actually decided to direct 70, uh, 700,000 of euros that were intended for um, human papilloma virus uh, vaccine to uh, vaccine for ordinary flu. So they took from the budget for, that was intended for that and this vaccine needed to be implemented till the end of 2019. So they were already late and now uh, it's very uncertain whether they are going to, uh, to, to have the vaccination against HPV or not because they took all that very uh, big amount of money and uh, they will spend it for the ordinary flu vaccine and for some medical staff uh, equipment. And um, we have the situation in our country that um, healthcare is not that accessible again for uh, common women, not to mention again uh, women from vulnerable groups. Uh, and um, if, if even if they decided that it's not, uh, that there are not, they don't have capacities for this vaccine at the moment, they could have um, actually direct this money for some other health services for women. But uh, it's, it's uh, actually, it's a matter of discrimination. And in this case, it's, I would say it's structural discrimination, which even needs to be uh, maybe taken in front of some uh, international bodies that are dealing with discrimination, such as CEDAW committee. So uh, we have uh, actually all the whole situation actually just reflected the very adverse position of women in our region and the huge, huge differences and inequalities that are already present. Yes, thank you, Maya. I think, I mean, the issue of funding is something that I want us to return to later on, both for NGOs, but in public, in terms of public funding as well. Uh, but um, again, mindful of time, uh, the third and last question is what, in light of everything that we've discussed uh, so far and things we haven't managed to discuss yet, uh, what do you foresee to be the gendering consequences uh, of this pandemic? So kind of thinking more long term, not just until we get the vaccine, even though the vaccine for all of us might be for way further down the line. Um, Ermira, first I'll, I'll go to you uh, because I know you have to leave and then we'll, we'll continue talking with uh, Anna and Maya. Uh, thank you very much and I'm, I'm really sorry that I, I have to leave and um, because there are so many things that uh, we, ha we can say about these issues. Uh, I mean, for the last uh, question, I'm kind of an optimistic person in general, but not when it comes to gender issues because uh, I don't know. So um, unfortunately, so I mean, I'm optimistic in the sense that it was not because of the pandemic that we had this situation. So uh, it was even even before it just it was a little bit more clear to, to our eyes what happened. And uh, uh, I remember when I was living uh, in Lisbon, there was this graffiti that uh, during the economic crisis and it was saying it's not uh, the crisis, it's capitalism. So now I would say it's not pandemic, but it's patriarchy and uh, greed. So uh, 
this this pandemic showed us that we need social safety nets like the welfare state that they are saying to us that it's not good it's not good we have to cut public funds etc etc in order to uh, develop that's not true we need welfare states we we need the, the public health care system we need unions in order for people not to work without contracts and in precarious situation and i think gender is everywhere so i'm not focusing just on women and men or on the situation of, of women but in all the parts of our society i mean we really need to think to rethink about the welfare state and the social safety net so that that's what uh, i would i would say and i'm very sorry that i have to leave i'm i'm extremely sorry so and i thank you elena for keeping time so you can allow me to leave in time and thank you very much and uh, i mean I'm sure the continuation would, will be great of the panel. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much, Elmira. Thank you for joining us and for sharing your insights. We'll continue talking about some of them after you leave. Good luck with everything you need to <laughs> Thank you today. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Maya, bye. Uh, Maya, shall we go to you and then Anna can, um, can wrap it up in the end? Yeah, well, uh, related to, to your question about the consequences, well, it's obviously uh, very clear that the, this pandemic will have adverse uh, effects on, um, of course, women and men. And, and again, uh, I also have to apologize for always using this <laughs> binary division, uh, but also on uh, quality of life of, of people in general. But I, I'm really trying to focus a bit on um, something more positive, which is not very easy, but at least as I mentioned, um, it is obvious that um, uh, this adverse position of women will definitely uh, have bigger effects on uh, our societies. So we have uh, those researches that uh, for the first time, actually, at least in my country, are um, uh, bringing issues that were not um, somehow part of the public dialogue. They were not even the part that much, uh, I, I can really say, of uh, um, dialogue uh, uh, proposed by women civil society organizations like this, what we were talking about uh, unpaid uh, work and uh, unpaid care that women are undertaking. Somehow uh, we are stuck uh, somewhere in the second uh, the wave of feminism uh, talking about uh, public sphere, not that much about private life. So we have now the, the data at least that are really showing how big burden on, on women was. And I will just share with you the recent data from the uh, UNDP research that said that estimated monetary equivalent of unpaid care and domestic work for three months of the beginning of pandemics uh, was 122.3 million for women and 63.5 million for men. So it means actually that work done by women in the domain of unpaid care and domestic work exceeded that done by men by 92%. So this is uh, the data we never had before. I mean, we knew about it. It was you know, like something really common, but at least we have it uh, in written. We have a, a, a data that are showing this. So um, from from us, one aspect is that we now have um, the data that we can work with and that we can always uh, raise this uh, topic in public. Uh, but at the same time, there are other things that actually and we're showing uh, how our institutions, for example, can be really efficient when it comes uh, to uh, breaking of the measures against pandemic, pandemic. And we now actually call upon them to be uh, efficient in the same way when it comes to violence against women. So that was actually our first response to this crisis when we saw how our prosecution offices are actually very, very um, quick when it comes to breaking the measures against pandemics. So people were uh, very quickly prosecuted, etc. At the same time, they were not reacted in cases of breaking uh, protection orders for women. So now we are we use this example actually to claim the same for for uh, victims of gender based violence. Uh, so that's uh, one again thing that we uh, are using at this, at this moment uh, that maybe might be considered a bit of positive effect of the pandemic, but of course uh, there are many other issues that are not uh, that positive and I will completely um, confirm what my uh, what other colleagues said about uh, uh, having social security measures, having uh, 
the welfare state uh, as uh, something that is really, really important in these very difficult times. Thank you, Maya. I think that's a very um, innovative way of, of, of thinking because like we've seen um, responses of how curfews and lockdowns have limited people's liberties and freedoms and whatnot. Uh, then we've seen on the other hand this um, I would say advocacy for stronger measures to so this in, in, uh, continuous, I would say, uh, kind of um, tiptoeing between collective responsibility and individual or individualized responsibility. Uh, but we haven't necessarily seen the, the issue of suggesting if you can actually be this effective with other things, can we not see that in, in areas where that's much needed really? So I think that's a very important aspect to um, to engaging with institutions um, in, in, in this response. Um, Anna, onward to you. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe it would have been uh, better if I was second uh, mm -hmm. and Maya was uh, would come uh, came after me because uh, she showed this uh, silver lining. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, currently, unfortunately, I mean, uh, Similarly to Ermira, uh, I'm uh, in a more uh, pessimistic uh, mode, which uh, so it's also for me good to be reminded of the, the of the existence of creativity and resistance. Uh, and uh, also I had to think about this proverb uh, fall eight times, stand up nine of like never uh, give up. Uh, but so but let me uh, give at uh, uh, pay respect to my uh, pessimistic <laughs> prognosis <laughs> um, so I am, I am I'm really worried about the health and well-being uh, of uh, women uh, I, and uh, I will I will say several things uh, where uh, which I uh, came up with um, so I still uh, I'm worried about the exacerb exacerbation of the existing diseases because women will not have the time uh, or the money to go to a doctor. Uh, we also have to keep in mind here the fact that the public uh, health institutions are mainly now focused on uh, treating the COVID-19 uh, patients, which also means that it's very much more difficult, close to impossible to schedule a checkup if you have uh, cancer, a uh, heart disease uh, or another uh, serious uh, condition. And even when uh, it is possible to have a checkup, the waiting lists are much longer uh, and we know that the time matters in such uh, situations uh, and this can lead to serious conditions being left untreated for much uh, longer time leading to uh, much more uh, serious consequences and also the sociological uh, this very gender component uh, about uh, how women are raised to put the needs of the uh, everybody else first uh, uh, rather than their own needs. So women might uh, uh, postpone the visit to a doctor also because they have to take care uh, of a sick member because they have to uh, get one more uh, in, uh, informal a formal job to pay to, to earn some uh, so besides the uh, exacerbation of the existing uh, conditions and diseases, I'm also so worried about the development of, of new ones, including burnout, a uh, very serious uh, uh, condition which is still uh, in our uh, in the, our region, the Western Balkans, is still not seen uh, uh, as as a serious thing. It's seen as somebody uh, being uh, 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 just playing a victim. Uh, and uh, so I'm also worried about the higher m m mortality rate, what the increased uh, uh, exposure to domestic violence will mean, both uh, in for the physical and the mental health, uh, or we consequences of a decrease of income and uh, job loss. And also we also have to mention here the access to abortion and contraceptives. What does this mean if uh, we have now uh, indicators showing that this access uh, is reduced? So what does it mean to uh, in such a severe condition to become uh, to, to, to be pregnant without proper uh, uh, health care? What does it mean to give birth to an unwanted child? What does it uh, mean to uh, 
uh, not be able to uh, to receive access to safe to legal uh, and safe abortion and having uh, have to go to uh, uh, clandestine abortion, which might not uh, necessarily be safe, and um, more often than not, than not, will be very expensive. So again, the question of affordability. Um, and also, just to return to the point which I make uh, made at the beginning, I'm also worried, uh, and which also then Elena mentioned about the consequences of the vaccine potential on pregnant uh, women. I'm also worried about what uh, if this uh, if, if drugs and vaccines are not tested uh, properly. Uh, what uh, on women, uh, what uh, the consequences be on their health. Uh, and another aspect, uh, and maybe then uh, not to speak too much, I will close uh, uh, for the time being with this. Uh, I'm also worried about uh, uh, the advance, uh, the advancement of women in their careers, uh, how, how they will develop, uh, be able to develop uh, professionally. Uh, and, uh, I, I, I expect that there will be a decrease uh, in the career advancement of women and uh, not only because of uh, decreased health, decreased, decreased well-being, but also because of being unable to uh, meet, uh, to, to, to produce all the requirements, like in the academia, for example, it's very important to have articles published. Um, and uh, what if you are unable to uh, write? Uh, as studies have indeed shown that women are indeed submitting much uh, fewer articles since the pandemic. Um, so uh, uh, because of domestic duties, one has to think because of improper working conditions, one has to think also about how many women have a room of their own. Virginia Woolf was already discussing that, uh, uh, how the importance of having a room of one's own. And in our days, the importance of having a laptop of your own and a good internet connection of your own. Um, I and also, uh, 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 I expect that uh, women will uh, re have, uh, will reduce their participation uh, in voluntary activities, uh, and one has to think here about various charities, shelters. Maya mentioned some of these uh, things, uh, um, uh, soup kitchens, but also uh, then in the more political uh, 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 domain, like in public debates. Uh, and even like in webinars like uh, this one, which uh, all the kinds of uh, uh, work which has to be done in addition to everything else and usually it's not being paid. So uh, and I also then in the, uh, in the long run, I expect uh, that our countries will become even less democratic because women will have less uh, energy, time, uh, uh, willingness to participate in the political process. Yes, that is somewhat gloomy, but uh, I don't disagree with the assessment, but it is. Uh, I will ask you at the end what is if you can think of one positive thing. That's how we will end today. But before that, I mean, thank you very much. You have provided so much food for thought. Um, and even though it, we didn't necessarily speak about this beforehand, each of your answers kind of sp spoke to one another, all, all three of you. Um, so that's very much appreciated and kind of built on each other. I have many questions of my own, but we have two questions in the in the Q&A um, chat now. And let me also encourage um, the audience to ask any questions they, they might have. So I'll start with um, Jelena Milinovic's um, comment and then question. Um, she writes, I'm aware of the backlash on women's human rights and gender equality in recent years, which has arisen as a political process by authoritarian regimes connected with uh, religious leaders. The crisis of the neoliberal model of capitalism and the current pandemic show that human and natural resources have almost collapsed and that it is very difficult to expect things not to get worse in such condition. I fear the gender roles and the gender division of labor will be even more cemented. What is your opinion? So this is a specific, I mean, we spoke about this in, in kind of different aspects uh, already. I think uh, Anna, well, both Anna and Maya spoke of, of, of the, the gender division of labor. Um, but if you could maybe also tie that to other ongoing processes, not just the pandemic, but processes of we've seen such a big global pushback against women's rights. Uh, we've seen, well, not in the current in, in the countries 
in the current governments of um, North Macedonia and Montenegro, but we've seen in the region as well massive pushback against women's rights, against against things that were guaranteed in the Yugoslav times, uh, against things that we kind of took um, as granted. So if you could re uh, briefly um, reflect on this. Well, uh, I fully agree uh, with this uh, said comment, and um, yes, it is very much difficult. Also, uh, very much also related to use the resources we had, and uh, in particular in Montenegro, we had a situation where the resources were misused by the political elites actually for many, many years. And it's, it of course reflected the, the position of women in our societies, and when it comes to the uh, back, general backlash of women's rights. Yes, there is a, a common trend throughout Europe where we have uh, more, uh, much bigger influence of religious groups, and it didn't um, miss Montenegro as well because we now have uh, actually the new government, but which was which came into power uh, mostly thanks to the huge support by the church. And since the situation in our country is with very low living standards and poverty is on the rise, I I, I guess that that it will also uh, in a way, it, that's how historically actually happened, in a way also strengthened the role of the church and religion in our societies. And uh, some of the consequences of that are already quite, quite. And um, what else to say except to, that I'm really, I agree actually totally with this comment. And uh, um, what the pandemic also showed uh, is that, um, uh, that, for example, women in civil society were very much involved also in protection of uh, natural resources. And now more than ever it came into picture that how important actually it is and how misused our national resources are and how women were not at all consulted in those processes and policies but which were made related to our natural resources. Thank you, Maya. Uh, Anna, do you do you have any reflections on this? Well, this is like the, the big question. How do you bring about a positive social change? Mm -hmm. A change which you deem, of course, uh, positive. Uh, there is no consensus about that. And it is also one of the problems about bringing about a social change. Uh, but um, let's uh, like, yeah. Uh, and then now I will step more. Uh, uh, I will call the positive, uh, the activists, the not go, we never give up, <laughs> uh, Anna, uh, for uh, for help. Uh, despite the gloominess, uh, despite uh, bad prognosis, it also remains the fact that we can never know for sure when and how uh, a change can. Happen also a positive change. Sometimes uh, we have uh, 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 women work uh, or so, so activists work for many years on a certain issue and then something happens and it is all of a sudden possible uh, to get the women to vote or uh, to have uh, uh, recognition of same sex um, uh, partners to have even uh, the possibility of have a legal sex change in North Macedonia in a document of a trans person, something which I wouldn't I wouldn't have thought would be possible in many more years to come. So uh, despite the gloominess, the lack of resources, uh, all of us walking on the edge of burnout uh, and uh, uh, all, all these things having to deal with domestic violence and all kinds of uh, violence around us. I, I think it is also important never to lose sight of the, also the resources which we'll still have, the networks which we'll, we still have, the networks which we can build. Uh, the, the pandemic also showed that we can do much more online uh, than uh, it would be deemed possible that we can have also much more of our private lives uh, and connections. We can continue them uh, online. So this is maybe would be a very general thing, uh, and it's also also it's not meant to say it generally because everybody will then find for themselves in their own environment, you know, their own networks, resources. What is which you can change in your. Uh, personal, uh, private life, professional work life, uh, 
and one of the th first things is to, to discuss uh, issues. Uh, it's like uh, something uh, things will never change by themselves and the time will never be right. We have to set things uh, in motion to make the time right. I like this activist Anna being uh, positive and thinking um, of, of, of how we can move forward from this. And there's a question about this, but I'll keep it uh, in the Q&A, but I'll, I'll keep that for the end. Um, I'll go to another question now, which asks, um, I mean, to contextualize the question a bit, uh, and I, I hope I'm doing it uh, justice. We have seen um, the global hierarchies of care even more exposed in the global movement of care workers even more exposed during the pandemic for for instance while germany was in lockdown there was no problem for it to allow for trains filled with romanian and and, and bulgarian care workers to arrive um re also related to the kind of conditions in which they lived and so on and not just health workers but actually also um workers that were uh, that, that that picked um um, produce and vegetables and, uh, and and fruits and so on. I mean, here in the in the UK, I know that um, many Bulgarians were were brought in on special on special flights to help with picking of of, of strawberries without necessarily being provided uh, personal protection equipment and so on. Uh, but uh, with 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 that in mind, or maybe not even with that in mind, the question is. Um, if we can comment on the problem of people escaping Western Balkan countries after a pandemic because of poverty from gender perspective. So uh, taking into consideration the current context, I think, and what we have what has been a trend from the region for decades, well, a couple of decades now, um, but also thinking forward of the way we've, as we've spoken that the pandemic economically will hit or, or rather than an economic crisis will inevitably follow um, the pandemic. If we can also think of people on the move and migration processes in the aftermath of whatever the aftermath means here. I don't know when, like whether there's a clear, clear, clear line or where, where it begins or where, it's, uh, where it ends, but in the aftermath of this uh, from a gender perspective, if that makes sense. Whoever, I mean, there's only two of you, so whoever wants yeah. to start can start. Well, uh, it's I mentioned something about poverty in, in already, and it is obvious that it's going to stri to strike hard after it's already striking hard, and it's going to be uh, striking even harder. We already had very um, not very successful economics here, and um, it's similar again in the whole Western Balkan region. And um, it's our, actually the government measures proven to be inefficient when it comes to um, protecting uh, individual rights of workers and uh, um, particularly uh, protecting women from being fired during the pandemics. And it's, uh, it's already obvious that it's going to be very difficult times. And um, in this situation, uh, uh, somehow, again, uh, I would say that civil society is undertaking the role of um, state institutions uh, when it comes to taking care of people who are in the very adverse uh, life situations, uh, de dealing with poverty, etc. So we have um, uh, a certain what is also positive, and I guess I'm somehow used to, to try to find something good, although it's not easy, I have to say. There is that sense of solidarity that somehow appeared uh, a bit more during the, these times, and we have uh, very different initiatives. Uh, some uh, that came um, that were not organized, that came from uh, from uh, citizens that were dealing with um, supporting uh, their neighbors or um, other citizens that are facing poverty, etc. But of course, it's not the answer to this uh, question. It's something that is. Uh, actually uh, uh, that is uh, uh, a sort of um, a situation and um, that that is uh, requiring uh, some urgent actions but it's not something sustainable of course and there is uh, of course we need to have uh, awareness uh, on the higher le higher levels levels of our institution on this that, that is going to happen and uh, in general the problem of migration from the people people from the Balkan region was a problem and uh, I'm sure it's going to be even bigger in the future, and uh, this, of course, needs to be uh, the, the part of specific dialogue with the state institutions and something that needs to be discussed on the higher levels in our society, in our state, actually. 
Thank you, Maya. I mean, we've already seen, and this was before the pandemic, um, projections that the region will be emptied out almost of health um, uh, healthcare workers um, in a couple, in, well, in a, not by the end of the decade uh, because of, of well, uh, being undervalued, overworked, underpaid, and so on, uh, which the pandemic has exposed even further. So I think that um, we'll also see in particular sectors stronger movement um, than, I mean, if it's possible, a stronger movement, but stronger movement than what we had seen before as well. Um, Anna. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> again, <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, the gloomy uh, <laughs> the, uh, prognosis. Um, yeah, despite uh, the, this, uh, in, in, in addition, not despite, in addition to this, uh, uh, to the uh, brain, uh, to the brain drain, uh, basically the body drain uh, uh, from uh, uh, bodies drain from the from the Balkans. Uh, it's also uh, it remains a question. Uh, once a person emigrates, uh, how uh, easy it will be for them to find a legal employment? Because we can also expect if uh, because of uh, if countries enter recession, with uh, uh, a, a refugee a refugees uh, uh, and uh, 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 refugee flows, but also um, increase of uh, xenophobia, uh, of intolerance. How uh, what the procedures will be uh, to to find uh, proper uh, legal work uh, as an as immigrant outside of the uh, not having an EU passport, and what will then also mean uh, for uh, for people who will end up in these uh, precarious uh, jobs uh, without uh, uh, hardly uh, any security. And we already knew that uh, women very often when uh, they uh, go uh, in Western countries. Uh, they, besides uh, enter, uh, being care workers, uh, like in hospital, elderly people homes, they also work, then al already worked informally, taking care of elderly uh, people, for example. That is a very common example in Croatia and Istria, women going to uh, Italy, uh, also when women going uh, from uh, Romania to Western uh, countries, uh, from Slovakia. Uh, and. Uh, so what will then, uh, if we if you think that we already have women who uh, I worried precarious position uh, without access to proper health care, uh, all uh, close exhausted, close to burnout, or already having gone through one or two burnouts, what will additionally then happen uh, to them uh, once they have to uh, emigrate? Uh, what can what I also see as a pot possibility. Uh, a possible development is that many of us who have to reschool uh, basically change professions uh, because, uh, as we are, uh, if we think that there is less and less money for social science, sciences, uh, and uh, now with the pandemic, we also see that uh, the accent goes. Uh, investments uh, in, in the medical sciences and ma there is much, much less uh, uh, funds uh, to, to explore the social consequences uh, uh, of uh, of the pandemic, something you need social scientists for. So I can imagine uh, that uh, many of us who are in this field of social uh, and uh, which also means that uh, we'll, there will be also further gaps in the knowledge uh, on uh, these uh, specific issues, which are only targeted uh, and or understood in depth by uh, by social uh, sciences. Thank you, Anna. And actually, this brings me to one of my questions that I mentioned earlier to something Maya was saying uh, about funding. Um, um, Maya, I mean, you work in the NGO sector, so uh, I would like to hear your reflection. And Anna, of course, if you're familiar with this, uh, your reflections too. Um, Anecdotal evidence, uh, or from what I've heard from people working in the sector uh, in the region, a lot of funds from donors, so which have been the bloodline for many NGOs, uh, because often funding is not available through other sources uh, from public institutions and so on. Um, so a lot of the funds that otherwise would be directed towards gender equality or exploration or support of women's issues, uh, 
as well as funds for other um, uh, funding lines have been redirected towards COVID specific issues, which have not necessarily been gender aware or gender sensitized. Uh, what has been your experience? I mean, like, can we also talk about, yes, social scientists with, will probably, uh, and especially in the region, will probably end up with a lot less funding um, in, in, in the aftermath of the crisis. Uh, but I would also like to reflect a little bit on, this, on the situation with the NGO sector, which has been, as, as both Ermira, I mean, all three of you really mentioned, has been the provider of services that uh, by and large the states have not been able to provide, um, not just to LGBTQI people, to victims of sexual and gender based violence and so on and so forth. Um, they have also been the, the, the primary advocates for gender equality and for highlighting these issues. Um, so if you if we could reflect a little bit on that um, as well, please. Well, uh, we already have some some announcements that uh, EU funding will be more uh, focused on, uh, on um, uh, tackling the effects of the pandemic, uh, where the gender uh, dimension of this funding will be a bit blurred with the, with the uh, current happenings. And uh, for my organization in particular, we already had the funding for this year, but for what will happen for the, when the pandemic started? But what will happen in the future? It, it's going to be again uh, very uncertain because we do expect that uh, most of the funding, particularly EU funding that is the most important funding for the civil society in our region will be more uh, focused on uh, pandemic effects. Uh, also, what we noticed, uh, uh, many of our organizations are actually um, needed funding to direct support of our beneficiaries. And that is something that uh, was was not very uh, it was not the priority even before the pandemic for example <clears throat> uh, some, when i say direct support i think not only about uh, providing legal representation legal aid psychological support for example but also other other sources like uh, for example providing uh, for food hygiene for providing for really basic uh, necessities for those women who are remain out of work who worked in an informal economy were not secured at all and in this situation, the state uh, didn't um, appear to be very efficient in uh, because the, the whole structure of social welfare was not prepared for this. And it was already quite unjust uh, and gender blind even before the pandemics. And now it really um, became quite obvious. So beside our regular work, we actually tried to focus also on how we can provide uh, some direct support to, to our beneficiaries and we were trying to to get um, uh, food hygiene packages and that kind of stuff from the donors but it is very difficult because uh, it's perceived always to that it, that kind of support is not sustainable that it's something that should be done by the state and ensured by the state and for that reason uh, it's very uh, hard, I mean, to, to explain to women that you cannot help them with some really basic needs, but you, you can provide uh, advo advocacy, for example, for their rights, etc. So I think that uh, in the future, all the major donors should also focus on some really very basic needs of, of people in this uh, region, particularly, again, women and women from vulnerable groups, because, because uh, when somebody is focused on uh, pure survival, then I'm not sure it's able to actually think uh, wider on the human rights and uh, to fight discrimination, definitely. Yes, exactly. We we cannot, as they say, we cannot eat the products of advocacy. Yes. Uh, well, not in the short term yes. anyway. Uh, we do need the bodies, um, you know, in order to be able to to, to do the advocacy. Uh, Anna, I don't know if you have any insights on this question. I mean, I know that your work is um, is, is elsewhere, but I don't know if you if you've come across anything or if there's any insights you want to share. Yeah, I just saw a short uh, comment. Uh, it's very uh, good what uh, that Maya you pointed to both aspect of when you're a social activist uh, of the forms of social activism and one uh, is offering a direct support uh, because yeah we, people have we have bodies which need to be fed taken care of uh, uh, etc. Uh, and at the same time, uh, there is uh, also this frustration that uh, uh, without uh, knowledge, without systemic change, you cannot satisfy uh, 
uh, everybody, uh, everybody's uh, basic uh, needs, even more so in a context when there is a less and less funding uh, for it. Uh, so, uh, and I, also sometimes among social activists, I have the feeling that we, uh, we can forget the importance of both aspects, that all of us are needed and those who are uh, highly uh, better placed in societal hierarchies, so have more access, be, are more able to lobby, to advocate for certain um, changes, not among, only among the local government, but also among the funders or uh, European Union politicians and also the people who are who are then more uh, in contact and I don't make a dichotomy sometimes uh, people perform both uh, types of activities but also uh, and this other type of activity being having uh, having a good network uh, performing grassroots work and uh, offering direct uh, and, and this reminds me also, and this is like a link to my other work. Uh, this uh, all of a sudden I had to think about the wars, uh, the post Yugoslav wars, and uh, how the Belgrade and uh, Zagreb act feminist activists, whom I did analysis uh, 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 of, they at the same time they provided the work directly with women who were raped. They offered psycho psychosocial assistance, they distributed humanitarian aid, and at the same time they also tried traveled abroad, spoken for in media and tried to inform the general public, European politicians, uh, uh, American polit US politicians about the importance to criminalize war rape, to put an end to war rape. So this is uh, something which, yeah, both aspects um, uh, are, uh, are needed. And we also, so it's a call also for us social activists to, to support each other more. <laughs> yes, this. excellent. And this actually leads me to the last uh, question um, for today. We have about 10 minutes um, and there have been questions in the Q&A, which I, I mean, uh, I hope I will do justice to. Uh, but basically, could we um, moving forward, knowing what we now know, perhaps some of the things we didn't know the extent of back in March when um, when um, most of our countries were hit. Um, what are the immediate strategies? What can we do? What can we do as activists, as um, uh, NGOs, as researchers, as, as, as human beings, as gender uh, equality um, advocates, what can we do in the immediate and, and the sort of longer term um, um, response or lo longer term um, gender aware response, gender equal approach um, to responding to this and similar crisis? What can we do better? And if you can think of one thing that we've done, well, not me, but uh, you, um, the society or, or, or NGO, uh, NGOs or, or movements uh, that we've done well in response to the pandemic. Let's also highlight that just so that we, we, sh we, we share some positive responses. Well, cool. I, I can uh, share that what we, <laughs> the, the attempts to do whatever we can, uh, can almost brought us to burnout. So, Thanks, Anna, for mentioning that it's really uh, strange how women always somehow take the burden of uh, everything that is going on in the society. So uh, I think that the, actually what you also mentioned, Anna, that, that sense of solidarity in the region among women's groups that was very um, visible after in post-war uh, period in, uh, in, uh, in Yugosla ex-Yugoslavia is something that uh, somehow also is connecting us even today. So um, these are the issues we are actually um, discussing among ourselves in the Western Balkans uh, Women's Civil Society and talk a lot. But also what uh, showed us is that uh, the matter of intersectionality is something that we didn't, um, let's say, uh, discuss enough and that somehow our activism actually left some vulnerable groups behind. So I think that uh, this is also, again, the opportunity for us to reflect on on our work and how better we can uh, connect among each other, how better we can include it, not only organizations that we are used to, women organizations, but also other organizations dealing with, with uh, other uh, communities. So um, that's one, one of the way actually how we can work better. And I think it's very important because it's something that we are not discussing quite often among ourselves, usually because of the huge burden that we are facing at this moment 
exactly in trying to handle the situation in, in the best possible way. And another important issue is the issue of burnout. I think that this should also um, taught us to, to take better care about ourselves as well and uh, somehow to actually uh, have some um, reflection on how we can actually be healthier actually because um, in this job and in general being raised as a woman in western balkans where gender roles are so strong we are often we are uh, taught not to take that much care about ourselves to care more about others and i think this is maybe the time of the crisis that we should need that we should use also to think about ourselves a bit more than before yes indeed self-care is and becoming to encourage even more. each other actually to take care about each other to, to take care about self more yeah indeed i mean self-care is becoming even more of a radical act um yeah. in the current <laughs> in the current context um, thank you very much, Maya. Um, I, I mean, you're, you're, you're pointing to some things that um, perhaps that do not seem obvious to people who are outside the, the civil society sector and who do not necessarily see. I mean, there's been quite a few publications coming out now um, from joint projects of, of, of women's um, organizations around, well, not just women's organizations, uh, organizations dealing with gender equality more broadly uh, in the region. Uh, and, and, and there's so much we can learn from each other and support each other in, in, in doing this. And thank you also for raising the issue of intersectionality. We have mentioned Roma women, we've, you mentioned earlier women with disabilities, uh, we've mentioned L, uh, LGBTQI people and so on. But uh, yes, putting it front and center in terms of collaborating is, is something that's massively important. Um, Anna, no pressure of time, but we have five minutes left. <laughs> Wait, you're muted. You're muted. I wanted to say no pressure, but uh, only five minutes. No pressure, but you have to say women have to save the world. <laughs> it's in no, we indeed. Yeah, it's uh, like so what Maya was saying, the importance of self-care, this awareness uh, that uh, we need to take care of ourselves and also. And so this is I, again, I, I have to one of the things I mentioned very often. Uh, this image which many of us are very familiar with in a, in a plane when you put when you're advised to put the oxygen mask you are first advised to put it on yourself and then to put it on a child or somebody else who is not capable of doing it by themselves so this is an excellent metaphor uh, of, that we have also to keep struggling to, to also satisfy to, uh, our basic needs to remain sane to remain healthy because the system is not very likely to protect us uh, and um, but uh, for the positive, uh, then uh, other positive uh, things is that uh, are the accumulation uh, that we increasingly accumulate knowledge. So the pandemic uh, hardly started. There were already uh, many feminists uh, and gender scholars who were saying, "Watch out! We'll have a problem of domestic violence. Domestic violence will increase." And then, the, and then, for unfortunately, uh, that, uh, that happened. Uh, indeed, uh, fortunately, in this situation is that there is already knowledge which uh, can hopefully then also help in the future to detect uh, and uh, prevent uh, a negative social uh, phenomenon uh, earlier uh, in the process or earlier start advocating uh, advocating for more funds. Uh, for uh, 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 even not more funds, but uh, asking governments not and, fund and funders not to cut the existing funds, uh, which have already been uh, uh, initially earmarked for uh, women's uh, groups and shelters. And um, the, the other uh, uh, positive uh, things which I, uh, uh, we have uh, seen are the gr great exchange of knowledge. In, uh, we are such webinars, online lectures, uh, which technology has provided. And in this sense, has also benefited women who do, cannot afford to go uh, uh, abroad to a conference, to pay the conference fee, the plane ticket, or also who do, do not have the right to enter a certain country because of having to obtain visa or being without a passport, being stateless. So there, the, there are uh, certain, uh, there are also uh, have been positive uh, developments, also solidarity actions of collecting money at local level to the immediately assist uh, uh, people. So uh, basically, uh, yeah, uh, 
maybe a good way is to uh, self uh, to uh, congratulate ourselves on the work good work we have done so far uh, and uh, also think of uh, what else we can do but without having the idea that we can uh, save the world we can contribute uh, to saving the world to making the world a better place but it's not only up to us we That's need more partners way. we need more partners also among men men of, of different strata to include the intersectional component. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and I think that's a very uh, good way of, of wrapping up today's discussion, I think. I want to thank you both, and um so much for sharing your knowledge, your time, uh, your energy in a, in a already quite, um, quite intense wrapping up of the year. Um, I hope our audience has also benefited as much as I have uh, and enjoyed this discussion. Uh, thank you to the audience for joining us and for asking uh, such good questions. Sorry that we didn't we didn't manage to go through all of them, but I hope that at least we touched on on quite a few of them. Uh, and I hope that we will have more, not just discussions like this, but for products um, in the public domain, in the in the in the public policy that reflect these discussions uh, further, and that they're not limited to just women. Um, or to just certain um, certain strata of, of, of women. So with that, uh, thank you again. I wish you all the best for the remaining of 2020. We are nearly over that. Um, and best of luck um, with a lot of solidarity and love in 2021. Thank you.